recording purposes, if you could please start by telling us your name, surname and designation. I'm Penny Moore. I'm Associate Professor at the University of the Witwatersrand and the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. If you could let us know, what is driving the third wave of COVID-19 infections in South Africa? At this stage, what we know from intensive genomic surveillance, which means we're sequencing deeply across the country, it seems that the Delta variant is now driving the third wave in South Africa. And what do we know about the Delta variant and its origins? Yeah, so, so this variant was um, first identified in India, um, where it was responsible for the most recent wave, which, as many of you know, was, was a devastating wave in India. It's um, subsequently spread across the world. Um, it's now been identified in at least, I think, more than 90 countries at the last count. Um, it's spread where it has entered a country. It has spread very rapidly through those countries, often replacing the variant that previously existed in that country. And that's exactly what we're seeing now in South Africa. It's rapidly spreading. How does it differ from the other variants that we've seen? Yeah, so each one of these variants that we identify are um, distinguished from the other variants by a series of mutations. And you know, I can tell you the precise numbers of the mutations in the Delta variant, but it, it, is, it isn't really important. Essentially, what um, distinguishes the Delta variant is that it has um, a couple of mutations in areas that allow the um, virus to become less visible to the immune system, what we refer to as immune evasion mutations. And then probably more importantly for Delta, it has a single mutation that seems to confer dramatically increased transmissibility. And that we think is why this variant is spreading across South Africa and globally. So if you could describe the former in layman's terms, is this your immune system saying, I reject you, I do not recognize you, what is happening? Yeah, when we talk about immune um, evasion mutations or immune escape mutations, essentially um, this is a consequence of an ongoing arms race. So the, whenever a virus infects, any virus for that matter, including SARS-CoV-2, whenever it infects a host, um, it engages in a sort of a cat and mouse game with the, with the host immune system. So when we're infected, we mount a robust, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, a robust antibody response. And as a consequence, random mutations that the virus accumulates as it mutates um, are selected for. Anything that gives the virus a selective advantage um, comes to dominate. So a mutation that, for in, in whatever way, makes the virus less visible to the antibodies that have been developed in that person's immune, escape, uh, immune response are selected for, and that virus comes to dominate. And that's really the essence of how variants emerge across the world is um, they are selected for often by our immune um, systems, but in some cases selected for because they are better at transmission and that gives them a huge advantage. So two distinct mechanisms. How do viruses mutate and why? So all viruses mutate in the same way that we mutate constantly. This is how evolution happens. Uh, some viruses mutate much faster than others. So for example, um, until SARS-CoV-2 happened, I worked in HIV. Um, and HIV mutates infinitely faster than SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is actually relatively slow at mutating. But what happens is that these random mutations that all viruses accumulate, including SARS-CoV-2, mostly have no benefit whatsoever. But occasionally, occasionally a mutation comes along that either en enables the virus to hide better from our immune responses or enables it to transmit faster. And those mutations that give that virus an, an advantage are the ones that are then selected for. Mutation is a random process. It's what happens to the viruses that have a mutation that gives them a fitness advantage that really matters. It's been described as 30 to 60 percent more infectious. Is this the ability for it to hide better and transmit better? It's the ability for it to transmit better. So these two, these two separate concepts need to be um, distinguished from one another. Immune evasion gives the virus one advantage, transmissibility is a second advantage. In the case of Delta, the main advantage that it has is that it replicates so much faster than either the variant that we previously had in South Africa or the one before that. So in practical terms, what does this mean? Does this mean if I got into a lift on the second wave, I probably wouldn't have gotten it, but if I get into a lift now, my chances are higher? Exactly. So the chance of you becoming infected by somebody is much, much higher with this virus. And there, are, there we think we understand the biological mechanisms for that. Um, coronaviruses are called coronaviruses because they have a crown of spikes that surround the viral particles. The Delta virus, because it has a, an, a single mutation that we think is important, happens to have better spikes that surround it, and that gives it a selective advantage. Those spikes are the bit of the virus that that allow it to infect human cells. And the Delta, the Delta variant has better 
spikes has a better crown around it that enables it to infect cells faster. And that's really what gives it its selective advantage. The second wave was largely driven by the beta variant. Is that still circulating? Yes, um, though at a much, much lower level. So the, the second wave, as you say, was entirely dominated by beta. Um, the beginning of the third wave too, um, we saw beta, but it's been very, very rapidly replaced in most places by delta. Not to say that beta is no longer present, it is present, as are, as are some other variants that we do pick up in low levels, including alpha and eta and other variants. Um, it's the predominant variant, but certainly not the only variant circulating in our country. You know, the other concern has been our vaccine rollout and also concerns about efficacy with all these mutations. So, yes, yeah, so vaccines have been um, a worry to us since, since we realised that variants were going to emerge. I think at the very beginning of this pandemic, we all hoped that we were dealing with a single variant and it was going to spread across the world, but our vaccines, which we had shown, worked very well against that variant would do fine. And then beta emerged. Beta, the second wave variant in our country, was incredibly resistant to all antibodies. It's, um, I think, one of the most resistant variants that has been described perhaps on par with the with, uh, gamma from Brazil. And that, that really worried us in terms of how well our vaccines would deal with it. And so we spent a lot of time as a scientific community trying to understand whether the vaccines that we had would work or no longer work against beta. And if you could tell us a little bit how those studies were done. Yes, so there are many ways in which you can ask that question. Um, people like um, myself ask the question in laboratory studies, um, test tube work. Um, what we do is we take blood from uh, people who've been vaccinated and we take those antibodies in that blood um, and we say, okay, you recognize the old variant, how well do you recognize the new variant? So essentially we mix the blood from people who've been vaccinated with the virus in a very safe laboratory and we ask how well does do those antibodies in that blood kill the virus? And the other way, of course, you can, sorry, <laughs> the other way, of course, that um, the other way that people ask that question is through clinical trials. So that's um, a parallel approach and in this case, People either test um, in what we call efficacy trials, they test a particular um, virus as a particular vaccine as um, viruses um, are infecting people and ask how well that vaccine does. In the case of Delta, we haven't been able to do that yet in most cases because it's been such a rapid spread. So now we have to take the data that we have for other variants and take the data that we have for the various vaccines and, and extrapolate from that to work out what the probability is that we will be protected from Delta. So at this rate, we do not know how effective vaccines will be against the Delta variant. So we have good laboratory data and we have good clinical data. We have laboratory data now for AstraZeneca and for Pfizer and for Johnson & Johnson. All three vaccines, we show that those vaccines are much better able to deal with Delta than they would have been able to deal with Beta. So although we have Delta now um, throughout our country and and a huge problem with transmissibility, which is driving the huge numbers of infections. On the flip side, um, the one ray of hope is that actually Delta is much less resistant than Beta. So the laboratory data we have suggests that actually all of, the, of our vaccines will be better against Delta than they would have been against Beta. And there's also clinical trial, trial data to support that, what we call effectiveness data. So um, we cannot conduct these very well-designed, carefully thought out efficacy trials, but what we can do is we can watch what happens in people who have already been vaccinated in, in the real world and ask how well those vaccinated people deal with Delta. And there's very good data from the UK that suggests that, in fact, those vaccines will deal, do deal, in fact, in the real world pretty well with Delta compared with Beta. What sort of protection does a single jab versus a double jab offer to someone? Yeah, so when you're talking about single jabs and double jabs, you're probably referring to the Pfizer vaccine, which is a two-dose vaccine. Of course, for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that's a one-dose vaccine, so a different scenario. In the case of Pfizer, a single dose um, does offer substantial protection, in fact. Um, you, do have to, um, you do have to wait. Immune systems don't react immediately to vaccines. Once you re receive a vaccine, you have to give your body time to make antibodies and to make T cells, the things that protect you. And so that takes some days. But if you wait somewhere around 15 to 21 days, for example, after a single shot of Pfizer, you have pretty good protection up in the 80s, 90s against severe disease. You do get better protection with the second dose, which is why we encourage people to go for the second dose. Um, but you have you have pretty well, you pretty have pretty good protection after a single dose. 
And taking a look at South Africa's vaccine rollout, would you say that we are running out of doses, we are running out of vaccines, we don't have enough. Is it better to then give everyone a single jab as opposed to finishing off certain groups? Yeah, so this has been um, some of the thinking behind extending the dosing interval for Pfizer. When the Pfizer vaccine was first tested in clinical trials, um, the company suggested a 21 days. Um, so you would have your first vaccine and then you would come back three weeks later. On the basis of um, really interesting data that came initially out of the UK, um, that showed that if people waited a little longer, in fact, their immune systems reacted better to the vaccine. Um, we extended the dosing interval. And what that meant was that not only would people who received the second shot do better in terms of their immune response, but it would now allow us to extend our coverage to more people more rapidly in South Africa at the time when vaccines were in short supply. How long will vaccines protect South Africans against COVID-19? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, we don't know the answer yet. So uh, part of the problem is that this epidemic is too early and the vaccines are too early. So we can only tell you as long as a vaccine has been around. Um, these, you know, we, we, we have to watch and see how long antibody responses and T cell responses last after vaccination. The data we have looks really, really encouraging. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, for example, triggers antibodies that last out past eight months, which is as far as we've looked. Um, and I'm, I have no doubt that if we continue, as we continue watching, we'll see that those antibodies last out even longer. And the same is true for all the other vaccines, so durability, what we refer to as durability, how long they last. When we've looked at durability for all vaccines, they, they look pretty good. Um, so we, at this stage, we, we have no reason to change the vaccine regimen that we have in South Africa. We have no reason at this stage to bring in an, an additional boost, but it's something that we watch constantly. Um, we evaluate how long, how long these immune responses last, how high the antibody titers in are, which means how much antibody you have. Um, and on the basis of that, we'll continue to make decisions about whether we need a booster and what that booster should look like. Um, should the booster be the same as the old booster? Do we need to bring in new boosters that are based on the variants that are now spreading across the world? And we'll have the luxury of time to have learned. Yes, and we have, we have vaccine platforms now that are, are more amenable to tweaking um, than they have ever been. You know, we. Um, we have an array of vaccines at our disposal, all of which work really well against severe disease. Some of them are particularly easy to tweak, um, and that means that the vaccine developers, such as Pfizer and Moderna, for example, have already developed new generation, second generation vaccines based on beta, um, and those are being tested out in the field. So, so we, we have little time. We know that these vaccine responses in the existing vaccines work well. But we have a backup plan. In fact, we have many backup plans. Um, so the scientific community as a whole is, is learning to be much more nimble um, in dealing with this pandemic. We have reports of a new variant that's been isolated in the south of America in Peru, Lambda. How worried should we be about this? Yeah, so Lambda has been in the news a lot, a uh, lot lately. Lambda is a variant um, that, as you say, was first identified in Peru and was um, responsible for a really devastating epidemic that's ongoing there. It's uh, spread across South America, now detected, I think, in 29 or 30 countries across um, South America. It has mutations that um, suggest that it will be somewhat resistant to neutralizing antibodies. And there's very, very early data, very limited data on this new variant, but very early data that suggests maybe slightly enhanced transmissibility. Um, in countries where Lambda has met Delta, um, Delta continues to dominate. So um, in terms of what we call fitness, it seems that Delta is still a fitter variant um, than Lambda. Um, it doesn't at this stage look, um, look like a beta. It certainly doesn't worry us as much as beta worried us when that variant emerged. But the one thing we've learned in this field is not to be complacent. So, so while at this stage, I would say Lambda is not a particular concern for South Africa, that might change by tomorrow. And it relies on hugely deep sequencing and continued monitoring. At this stage, Lambda has not been detected in South Africa. How concerned are you about the emergence of new variants like Delta and Lambda? Very concerned. Um, I think, you know, we've seen over the last year what happens when variants emerge. You know, they, they emerge and they drive these huge waves of epidemics and result in huge loss of life. Um, as I said to you, variants, variants emerge from people who are infected and um, until we can um, bring down the numbers of global infections, we will continue to see uh, variants emerge. 
So the only way, really, the only way that we can stop the emergence of variants is by lowering the numbers of infections. And the only way we can lower the number of infections is by increasing vaccination. So until we have good vaccine coverage across the world, we won't be able to lower the number of infections and variants will continue to emerge and will continue to worry us. So does this mean we can kiss our previous life goodbye and know that we're going to be living like this for a very long time? We certainly, in my view, certainly never going to be without SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's with us now for life, but I think its impact will become less and less. Um, I think so long as we can get those vaccines out, reduce the number of infections, reduce the number of variants that emerge, use our non-pharmaceutical interventions, I think those are going to be with us for a very long time, unfortunately. But I think the impact of this virus will become lesser and lesser. And I, you know, I hope, I hope that um, in due course one day. Um, in the not too distant future, this will become more like what we used to with flu, um, where it's there and um, it does kill people, but not at the levels that we're dealing with now. And we can access vaccines and most people will deal with this as a sort of a day-to-day -day virus that we can live with. Um, it will be a very different situation, I hope, to what we're dealing with now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content. <music>